I have special guest, Than from Tidal Gardens. Yet again, this time we're talking about frag tank system design, ideas to make the optimum frag tank. I've screwed this up a couple of times, gotten better every time, but today we're gonna learn something new. Uh, and the first idea here is Eurobrace. Yay or nay? I'm a big Eurobrace guy. Really? Big time. Okay, I thought for sure it was the opposite on this. Okay. Explain. Really? Okay. So, um, long story short, we've been doing this now since about 2002. Okay. And, and I've always been on like the hunt for what is like the best operational frag system for us. And so we've like experimented with all sorts of things, the heights of the tanks, whatever, but specifically the bracing. Mm -hmm. um, you don't really need the Eurobrace for any kind of structural thing when you're talking about a very shallow aquarium. But they come in so handy in a work environment just to be able to set stuff on them. Uh, and just whenever we're using any kind of like magnet cleaner, mm -hmm. like uh, the amount of splashing that happens on these tanks when you don't have a Eurobrace. Oh, it's shallow. Yeah. And just like just operating a magnet, oh my gosh, it changes everything when you have the Eurobrace to hold all the water from splashing in. So I've got like this little story. We added a Eurobrace to one of our only aquariums that was rimless, mm -hmm. but we did it kind of like uh, kind of like a C shape, uh, and the only part that didn't have it was from the internal overflow box that was inside the aquarium. Okay. And so I was cleaning this aquarium up with a magnet, and then I had to relocate the magnet into the overflow box to clean out the overflow box. The minute I took that magnet and put it into the overflow box, it slaps shut, and then a huge wave of water comes and hits me. Because uh. that was the only part that didn't have a Euro brace. Mm. It's like, oh, I can't stand rimless. And just like the one little bit of rimless, immediately I, I get wet. So. So, you know, it's funny because I was thinking about this and most of the ones I've had have been uh, Euro braced, you know, just, you know, to save on thickness of the material and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and so I guess I've never thought about it that way. Uh, but I was thinking it was originally like when you saw this, I was like, I wonder if he wants no Euro brace because, you know, you can get to the lights and stuff to the mm -hmm. edges. It's a little easier to see uh, the things that are on the edges. But if you're doing this, man, especially if you're doing it for a living, splashes are constant. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you're gonna be going in and out of this thing all the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I would have never really thought about it in the terms of, and then even just like salt spray, I'd say, you know, is I had a rimless one on uh, my eight million years ago once, and it was like four by eights in my basement, and. Dude, like just the water hitting the edges and stuff would send salt spray over the edges. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and the the rim of like a Eurobrace does get dirty. You do have to kind of clean it more, but it does keep so much of like the actual show panels very clean. Well, you know, if you think really, it is a working surface too, mm -hmm. right? So I can come up there, I can set my tools down on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there you go. So you're saying. Eurobrace, way to go. 100% of the time. 100% yes. of the time, yeah. Eurobrace, and not for structure. Uh, yeah, it, it, it does structure, but it, it's the just the ergonomic benefits of working in and around the tank that has a Eurobrace are like sky high. It's so many good benefits. Okay, so I, out of curiosity, did you start with Eurobrace, go to non-Eurobrace and back again, or what was the path? So the path was uh, like the regular plastic aquarium trim to start with. Okay. And that's like probably the worst of all worlds. So it's okay. not very good. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went with like with a couple of rimless tanks and then I retrofitted Euro braces onto them over, over the years. And finally now, if I'm ever going to spec out a tank, it's always gonna be a Euro brace tank. So uh, like, I'm just gonna guess. When you went with no Euro brace the first time, did you think that you were solving a problem at that time? Or like, cause that's what I did is, I went even with like three quarter inch acrylic just to make sure it didn't bow and that I didn't have to have the Euro brace in there. And I guess what you're saying is probably right. Like I was solving a problem that wasn't worth solving and I created new ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably, yeah. So no, I didn't think that I was like 
necessarily like solving anything, like going like going to a rimless style. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, it was just kind of trendy at the time. Mm -hmm. they, they they looked pretty. They, they you know what? I will I will concede that they 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 are a prettier looking tank. I but when, once I started to really work with it, it's so much nicer to have like a Eurobrace. Okay, so the <clears throat> 360 in my office has a Eurobrace on it. It's mm -hmm. like a glass one. Okay. I have come to the conclusion for similar reasons that if I'm, as long as I'm going to have a hood, I will Euro brace the tank mm. uh, because a I can set like auto feeders on there, and then what the hood that I have is just like basically 80 20 beams, you know, mm -hmm. and then planks that go on, and so the planks I can just like they have doors, but if I want to I can pull the whole plank right off too, and then I have total access to this thing. In a way, I could never build that in a way that would rest on you know, a rimless tank, and then mm -hmm. it would also spray everywhere. And, all and that the salt creep make, make it, yeah. And then one really cool side effect of having those, uh, the Euro brace, and maybe this works in a frig tank too, uh, is that I hate magnets on the outside of the tank. Mm -hmm. It just looks ugly, right? And so uh, with the Tuneses, what I do is I just build it down a little bit and may use the magnet cleaner or magnet to hold it to the Euro brace. Uh, mm. And so the, Euro, the tunes comes down from the top and just kind of like, you know, rotates inside the water mm -hmm. in a way. So no magnets on the outside, really hard to see the cord or anything. And then I can aim it wherever I want. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can so see that. The Euro brace is what allows me to do that because I basically yeah. magnet clean right on. It's like the a Euro perpendicular brace. mount for it. Yeah. Now you do have to build it down. I, I just stack magnets, mm -hmm. but that's probably the most expensive possible way to do it. Uh, but you could probably super glue like a piece of pipe or something to a magnet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also seen like mm -hmm. uh, like people just use an extra thick Euro brace even, or and I've also seen like a like a a Euro brace that comes down from the edge. It's like recessed. Oh, okay. It's like a recessed perimeter on the inside. So I've, I've seen that before as well to get it down lower. Oh, interesting. That's There's creative cool. ways to do it. Okay. The next one here is you have an optimal tank height uh, for your frag tank. Before yes. you tell you, I just want to share the two that I don't okay. like either one of these. Right. Okay. The first one I was trying to save on water changes and stuff. Okay. And the size total system water. And it was like eight inches deep. And it just wasn't deep enough, man. Like, because I, 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 the water level had to be below that. And then I had, you know, egg crate and stuff in there. And it just was just too much, too shallow of a working area. And then I had these vertex ones at one point, which were like 18 inches deep. Mm -hmm. And that was just unnecessarily deep for me. So what is your op optimal depth? It's going to be closer to the 18 inches. Okay. Like once I, I think that once we get into like the, the 20 to 24 inches, that is now too deep to really maintain well. It's like, it seems unnecessary. Yeah. Um, so it can, it depends on what's going on inside the tank. For example, um, it depends on like the, the height of the, of the racking system that you have for, for your frags to grow out and all, out and all that. Because I, I want to have it high enough that tangs and stuff like that can utilize the space underneath the racks. Because yep. previously we did like one inch t like tall mm -hmm. racks and nothing can get under, not snails, nothing. So problems can, can happen there. So we wanted to have full access to underneath the racks. So we had in the vertex ones, it was probably about a, an inch and a half or something. And we wanted to be able to blow out, you know, all of the garbage that was under there. And there was like a closed loop to do it and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fish would go down there. And so all the tangs were like on its side. It's, exactly. They really wanted to be down there. Right. Uh, but way better would be just give them the room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And th But then you also want some room up top because going with like a, an 8 or 12 inch deep, uh, deep tank, you really are limited in how you provide flow to that system. Because a lot of corals don't like to get directly smashed by flow. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to put a ripping flow through this tank, you can do it. It just has to go over the top of everything. And you just can't do that in a super shallow frag system. So the combination of getting it tall enough for fish to utilize the area underneath, and also the enough headroom that you can send strong flow over the top if you wanted to, that gets us into about 18, 20 inches. Okay, so that's a good point. Because I felt like the Vertex one was 
just like a little too tall. Like I just had an unnecessary amount of head space in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if we had built it so that those tanks could swim around and you moved it up another two inches, it was probably about the perfect height because we use the same thing. We use gyres to send water down the sides. Mm -hmm. you know, and gyres are great, uh, like the low profile gyres, like so good to just make a, a bl like a narrow blanket of water like that. Mm -hmm. and you're not directly smashing up any of your, any of your corals. Well, and then in this case, what you can do, because you got it in this freight tank, is you can put a gyre on the top and a gyre on the bottom and mm -hmm. have them, you know, anti-sink. So when I'm shooting across the top, it's going to send water down back, mm -hmm. right? But then I can also, you know, shoot water down across the bottom and it's gonna have to return over the top. And mm -hmm. It won't be as high velocity because it would be spread over a large area, mm -hmm. but you're, you're getting you know, flow to both sides of the animal and you know, alternating. Nice, nice. Yeah, so oh, very cool. So uh, you would say, give me a number, your preference of 18 height. to 20. So, so this is where I messed up on a couple of custom aquariums. When you say you want an 18 inch tall tank, they're gonna go 18 is the very, very, very bottom, and 18 is the top of that Euro brace. Mm -hmm. If your tanks are large and you're using three quarter inch glass, mm -hmm. that is a total of an inch and a half. Mm -hmm. So your 18 inch tank is actually 16 and a half mm -hmm. of actual aquarium glass. Okay. And then on top of that, it's gonna come down another two inches or so for the water line. So your Thing is closer to like 14, 15 inches when you've requested 18. So, so you're talking I, about 18 inches of water, available water depth, and also understand that probably you're only going within an inch of the top. Yes. So it's 17 inches of water depth, <laughs> and then add whatever you need to achieve that. Exactly. Like yeah, once you're in that ballpark, uh, uh, you'll 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 have a lot of these little ergonomic advantages. I think. Mm, wise. Uh, light height. I know, okay. I know where you're going on this one. Okay. Uh, so one of the things about Tidal Gardens is you would think that, uh, that as a coral farm, we would be solely dedicated to trying to find the optimum everything for corals. Because a, a lot of like what we do and talk and think about is that, but in practice, Tidal Gardens is about people that work there. Mm -hmm. It has to be a, a highly functional work environment. And one of these elements of work environments is to be able to basically crawl on top of a tank if necessary. And so the height of the, t of the lights above the tank isn't necessarily the best thing for our par intensity for growing corals. It is just, is it far enough out of the way that it will never bump into our heads when we need to, to reach out yeah, we don't in, want to be like lifting them up and down constantly. No, no. Yeah. just it, and so th this is kind of like brute forcing this 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 problem, but uh, we could have gotten away with using ten lights on a ten foot long tank, but we could also use twenty lights. You know that that that, that sort of mindset. You, we could use double the amount of light. It, it, that's whatever's necessary, and raise it up four feet. So the reality is, is almost all of today's lighting is also designed to be mounted, you know, roughly eight inches off the tank. Mm -hmm. And so when you get it off, you're lighting the floor, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot of spill that's going to happen to be able to get light around the edges and stuff and why you got to use extra tools for the job. But uh, I mean, like, technically speaking, you could probably find more focused options, but mm -hmm. then you create new problems. Yeah, there's certain there's certain lights that have like customizable optics where you can like narrow the beam. The Kessel, I think. Uh, does Kessel maybe? Yeah, they have maybe. little they have little magnet things you can put on the bottom. Oh, okay. And it's kind of more of a reflector than it is a lens. I gotcha. Like we we've got some commercial units from Orphic, and they allow you to customize whatever beam angle you want on every single uh, like group of LEDs. Mm -hmm. So you can do anything from like 90 degrees all the way down to like a 15 degree beam. And that 15 degree beam is like designed for f tanks that are like 20 feet deep, stuff like that, like Dubai aquarium type stuff. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that like the that the one tank that we that we have these Orphix on, it's it's a really nice controlled uh, like a beam angle from about six feet in the air, which is kind of nice. Six feet, yeah. yeah. Oh, you know what? 
We played with uh, Kessel had another version that used uh, like a Fresnel lens, mm -hmm. and you could mount it on the ceiling. Yeah, and we I was really trying to figure out how to use that in a reef tank, like because if I could mount those in cans in the ceiling and never even see the light, mm -hmm. uh, and if you wanted to get extra scenario, fancy, but... you could. There's like a like the like shutter door type things for mm -hmm. for lighting systems. Yep, and you can carve it so that it, it there's no light bleed. Like you're down to the inch, it'll only light your tank. Mm. There, yeah, if you go check out Couples' website, they actually have these things that you can find them in a picture. I can't remember what they're called, but they have that. They have the little shutter doors on mm -hmm. there, and it's like the tank in their office that does that. But also the the Orphic that you're saying, like in our test, that thing seems to be optimal just out of the box at about 20 inches off the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably too close for you. How, are, how you are you thinking the Atlantics? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so the Orphic that I'm talking about is is their Amazonas. It's like oh. the public aquarium fixture. Uh. It looks like concert lighting. Okay, yep. Yeah. And so that that was like the one that's like six feet in the air. Uh, you know, sometimes like I forget that they make things that w aquarium, home aquarium still <laughs> use. Uh, yeah. yeah, but even the Orphic. And I think of uh, actually, uh, you know, for, to people at home, uh, you know, Sean's tank, the uh, guy lives up in Mankato, he's got a 2,000 gallon tank. Like if you open his hoods, it's Orphic as far as the eye can see Atlantic. So like, you know, end to end, mm -hmm. he's like created blanket. dust to dawn, man, all the way across the whole thing. And shooting from the hip here, probably four feet off because it's a giant tank and he needs to be able to crawl around up there, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's it can't super, be pulled out of the way. It's super nice to get like your, your lighting above your working head height mm -hmm. and all that. So yeah, for, for us, a lot of space and we suffer with par. Yeah, or you get a little bit of wasted energy mm -hmm. lighting the floor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so there you go. Uh, fish choices. This is pretty key. Uh, frag system. What? Which fish are critical? So what? Or not critical? Or which one should you avoid too? So the the <clears throat> excuse me. The main fish that we're looking for are like the herbivores and some manner of pest control. Uh, things like so on the herbivore side. Obviously, there, there's tangs. Our favorites are actually yellow tangs. I never thought that I would say that, but they seem to do like a really nice job. Nothing, nothing crazy. They, they don't really nibble on corals as much as some other tangs might. Um, the convict tangs mm -hmm. are maybe just one per tank, but they're like hyperactive. When you see the fish that you go snorkeling, you see them in schools just devouring algae. For yeah, living, you know? it's an acanthorus, so they can be really chippy towards one another. So we only do like one per tank of those. And if you if your if your frag tank is too small, they might get a little too extra hungry, because they are constantly at it. And I never thought that acanthorus are really that good as, of algae control, like powder blues, powder browns, Achilles. Like they're they're like very ho hum in performance. Convict tangs are nuts. They're mm -hmm. like on speed or something. So those guys for sure. Well, so I, I've kind of found like it's it's about mouth shape, you know? And so mm -hmm. like each of these mouths are designed to eat different types of algae. Like your bristle tooth like kind of scrape the rock. Yeah, they rasp. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, you know, the uh, acanthers are kind of like hunting for stuff to tug at, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, different mouths, different food, different algae. Yeah. But surprisingly, surprisingly productive. Um, I do like the, the I think it's stenochatus, like the, those are those bristle tooth tangs. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I like the taminis because mm -hmm. they stay small and they're not total, total jerks. Uh, I, I, I think that they do a better job than the coals and the and chevrons and chevrons are like so expensive these days anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, taminis are, are very high on my list. I definitely like fox faces for a lot of the, the macro algae. So uh, here's a debate topic. If you read about fox face, almost everybody that's in my circle will tell you that these things are very reef safe. But if you read about them, they will say with caution stuff. Where do you find the caution or is it garbage? No, they definitely can, can decide to nibble on coral. That so is what kind absolute. of coral would you? Uh, they specifically like to go for um, some of like the, the smaller polyped, uh, like favia brains, things like that. They really like to nibble on like platygyra, like those types of like brain, maize brain type stuff. Love to like nibble on that. Occasionally they'll nibble on micromusa or mm -hmm. acan lords, 
like that type of stuff. Um, they don't, they're not going to really mess with SPS, not really going to mess with soft corals or anything like that, but it's very specific LPS that they can get, get nibbly with. Like edges of some fleshy LPS corals? Yeah, exactly. Like just, just where like there might be like almost where like the skeleton is like meeting the, the flesh, they'll like just, just grab a nibble on that. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So outside of the algae eaters, do you find, uh, we call these like, I guess, utilitarian fish in this environment, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What other types of fish would you put in a frag tank you feel valuable? Uh, definitely wrasses. They can help control all kinds of like flatworm and nudibranch issues. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, we don't really pick and choose that many. We love melanarises. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with a Timor wrasse? No. It's a, it's a very pretty, like, uh, orange and white ras. Uh, it's, it looks kind of like a tamarind ras in, in shape. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's, it's, that, it's that style of ras. Um, occasionally, we do the six lines. And... Bullies. I, I, you know, we hear that they bully like crazy. For us, they, they tend to be the smallest ras in there, and they don't mess with anything. I, I've had like the opposite. Right? Really? They're just yeah, they're, unholy they're terrors? They're definitely the smallest and they will kill stuff. That's, and that's so funny. They are so aggressive. Well, not that. funny. But yeah. no, I, you're, you're, not the, uh, you're not the only person that's told me that. Like a lot of folks have had issues with six lines. You know, I think about this of like in terms of, uh, you know, aggressive breeds of dog or whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. something really nice, something we're not. You know, it's 50% nature, 50% nurture, some of its environment, some of its attitude, you know? Yeah. Uh, but like some of these things just seem to be more prone than, than not. That, that's, that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, what other wrasses? We have leopards, but they sh they're very poor shippers for us. Like when okay. we're, whenever we're trying to get leopards, it's, yeah. it's always like, is this really a good idea? Because like these, these are nice fish and all, but this is kind of not the most ethical thing in the world. You know, ones that I had really good luck with uh, treating for uh, uh, zoanthid nudies and uh, ultimately even flatworms and other tanks are the yellow and green chorus wrasse. Hmm. But terrible option for this because those guys jump. They jump like crazy. And you don't really want to have to put a lid on these tanks all the time. Right, uh, right. These are a working environment. Hands are going in, out all the time. Yeah. But like they're they're unbelievably effective you just watch them hunting for stuff constantly i love yellow chorus wrasses yeah, and cheap cheap fish and you know, they, they launch yeah. they're always i mean it's just like they're just shooting on all the damn time yeah but they're effective which is so strange because there's so many similar <coughs> excuse me similar wrasses that don't have that jumping problem same yeah. body shape everything well you were noticing those uh, arini tile fish right in my mm -hmm. uh, so we've had uh, purple ones. We had purple ones in this tank here. Uh, they're beautiful fish, man. Uh, and they jump. We could hear them hitting the tops all the time. And then one day, man, we left a little corner of it open, man, and they both went out. You oh. know, like a little corner. I think they'll find a way. The jumpers will find a way. They're waiting, man, for that moment. You know? Uh, so wild. Yeah, like. Need to escape. All right. So uh, one of them that comes to, comes to mind for me though is: uh, Do you have any fish that you would treat aptasia? Absolutely. So probably my, my hands down favorite fish of all time now is a copper band butterfly. Okay. I if 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 I had to, I would put one in every single tank I had. Uh, and we're only just now getting a lot better at bringing them in, uh, getting them through quarantine, and getting them all to eat. And it just involves giving them like the most insane cornucopia of seafoods offered and seeing and, and just making sure they eat something. And then eventually we wean them onto like mysis. And once once they're like healthy and happy, they eradicate like I, I guess eradicates like a, a poor choice of words when it comes to aptasia. But you will have a hard time finding aptasia in a tank with a copper band butterfly. So I got one recently, Elliot sent me one from Marine Collectors, and um, my experience is I've seen these, get them to eat and whatever, but they were always like so timid and they were like, did really poorly and flow and they were like getting bounced around and all that stuff. Okay, and then he sent me this one. And this one like almost behaves like a yellow tank. Mm -hmm. he, like he fights the flow and like is active and aggressive and goes after food in the same way. And I don't think I can share his secrets uh, publicly on this one. Uh, I bet you if he's here, he would let me, but I don't want to do it without asking him. Mm -hmm. But like he has found some ways 
to you know tr get these things to transition to you know uh, captive life in a way is that doesn't make them as you know skittish in their active aggressive eaters. Yeah, and that that's really important because I think that sometimes just like the stress of it all prevents that it, it makes them stop eating. And if you can avoid just like that that stress anxiety aspect of it, it's probably very very impactful. Well, and like I think we forget about accidents. Like you think about it, like it's just a fish or something. But like I plucked this animal man out of its natural environment, and then I dropped it here in Minnesota. And my presumption is everything will just be fine. Why don't you work out? That now it's saying that out loud just sounds dumb. Mm -hmm. You know, like that, that's the way that we do it. So he's found some ways to transition him to captive uh, life. And then when he's done that and they're already thriving, then they're the right pet for your tank. And then, you know, the like, you know, uh, mortalities that related to this like plummet, like mm. something that has really high mortality rates goes down to very, very, very low. Nice. You know, uh, if only you take care of the animal, right, and get them transitioned to this thing. And so... Uh, yeah, he charges for that service, but like, uh, I got news for you. You were paying for it anyway when you were going through 20 of them. Yeah, it's, you, you can't save money on dead fish. <laughs> can't save money on dead fish. All right, before we move on, is there any other fish that you think, like I think of the uh, Aptasia eating file fish. Like, I've never owned one. Really? Never once. Okay, so we have had hit or miss. They don't always eat it. Oh, okay. The, but the ones that do, it's all they eat. I've always heard they nip on coral though. I, I, which I already I, have fish that do that, but I've heard that they do. I haven't had that experience. I think we had one maybe that transitioned to that, and they just take it out. They're super easy, easy to fish, catch fish. I, mean, I probably catch it with my hand. Okay. Uh, I mean, they're not really great swimmers, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and so uh, I, they're inexpensive. They're just kind of not the most attractive fish known to man. Yeah, they look, like a, like a, they look like a leaf or something. Yeah. yeah. But in a frag system, who cares? Uh, like, so, but it, the reality is, is I think of, you know, starting a brand new tank. If you started a brand new tank, and even if it was a freight tank or not a freight tank, if I started with a couple of wrasses that, you know, eat, you know, flatworms and nudies and stuff, mm -hmm. I start with the different various algae eating mouths, you know, that are just eating this stuff. I start with a couple of options that eat Aptasia. Uh, I throw in maybe like some uh, emerald crabs for bubble algae or whatever, or a uh, fox face in there. Mm -hmm. uh, man, I'll have all of those things. I probably will just never know. Yeah, it's a, there's, there's a big difference between um, having a certain pest or algae issue uh, versus uh, having it in your system and it's just simply a, a non-factor. It's not even a thought. but it's always like funny, like you'll notice that you always did have a certain problem when unfortunately one of those fish passes mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, it was doing something. It was holding back this deluge of all these other issues. I had that exact experience on my very first tank. For whatever reason, yellow tank dies. Right after that, like the whole tank just erupts with algae, right? <laughs> Okay, and I didn't like correlate it at a time, but I was like sitting on the couch one day and I was just like looking at this thing, like it's rough, over, it's covered in algae. And I'm like, you know what, man? That fish that I had, all he did is sit there and eat that stuff all day long. All day. Yeah, that's all he did. Uh, and I hadn't gone to Hawaii yet and actually seen them in an environment where that's all they do there too. Uh, and then I added a, a, a purple tag, you know, and back to replace him. Same problem. I like just gone, just ate it all up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like, like oh, the reason I never had that problem is because I had somebody that ate that problem. Yeah, it's like so sometimes these, you, <clears throat> we take these herbivores for granted, and it's like oh, this is what life is like without it. That's this is terrible. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> I love that. Okay, uh, a single versus multi-level frag tank. Do okay. Tell. Okay. So. I've got uh, I've got some friends that are that have like commercial facilities as well, mm -hmm. and uh, they are more inclined to maximize every square foot of like operational space in their in their facility. Mm -hmm. So they want like the five stack of tanks and stuff like that because like you know hey this is twenty square feet I want to get as many as much coral growing capacity out of this as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. Versus me. I just want one level, and one level is working height. 
is working height because e even let's say let's 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 say you have like um, like a, a, a double decker system. Okay, mm -hmm. what you're basically telling me is you have two systems at both of them at the wrong height. <laughs> and that was the that was the reality of my greenhouse for a very long time because we went like multi tiered and all this stuff. And now in the in our new building, everything is one level, mm -hmm. and it is almost a perfect working height. I mean, it's a perfect working height for me, but I'm the tallest person there, and I do the least amount of actual whatever. <laughs> so it's not perfect, perfect, but um, the idea is that it is it is optimized as much as possible for the like the most usable working height. Now, what's funny though, is like in, in some of my friends' systems that do the multi thing, uh, it's one thing to say, uh, it's a home frag system and I'm gonna take care of it, I'm gonna make sure it's nice. It's a very different thing when you have a staff and you tell them to do it. What's gonna happen is the middle section will be cleaned. The top section will not and the bottom section will not. And no amount of you prodding your staff is going to make that happen. That's hilarious. The reality of the situation is only the middle tanks are going to get clean. And everything else is going to get neglected. And that's where all the problems are really going to start is in these neglected corners of like the tops and the bottom rows. So for us, everything is going to be optimized for the human working height. Okay, when I was a teenager, I worked at Target. And uh, I had to load the shelves, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, and all this comes to mind is no problem loading the toothpaste up here, right? And then it would come to the time where I had to like count and load all the stuff in the bottom, man. And even as a teenager, I'd kill my back, you know, because you're bent over for like an hour, man, you know, like just scooting across the floor. You know, like it is not an optimal you know, way to work. You no. Know? Uh, so I, I think of two things though, is uh, I got two guys that come to mind. One is there was a local guy who set up a frag system in his house uh -huh. and he lined his walls essentially with raceways, you know, so okay. it was like, you know, two foot deep, you know, or maybe 18 inch deep uh, tanks that would plumb into each other and they would essentially just kind of like fall. Okay. You know? Yeah. And I guess for him too, two of those raceways would probably be around the optimal height. The rest of it requires a ladder or getting down on your knees. Yeah. You know? Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Like a ladder's a non-starter. Like if you need a ladder to get up into, yeah, bad news. Yeah, it's a lot of shenanigans. And, and that one's totally out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's gonna go to bad. You know, the one though that actually uh, is different is the facility at Live Aquaria in, in uh, Wisconsin. Okay. Have you been there? I have not. Okay, so right when uh, they opened, they were super proud of it. And so they let everybody come to it. <laughs> I don't know if they still do that or not. But, uh, like, I don't even know what the state of that is now. But uh, when you would go there, what it was, man, is it was these big, you know, those fiberglass tubs, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, four feet wide by eight feet or whatever they were. Uh, and there was three rows of them. And like, I think like maybe four or five or six deep, I can't remember, okay. And then the way they did it, man, is that was on the top, and then they had a replica of it on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And the top and the bottom were all plumbed together, mm. right? And so they had a double stacked, but you could walk at a normal height, right? And they would maintain the pH and stuff because they would run opposite cycles of each other. Oh, so that's really interesting. So the lights really were on the top, and then on the bottom, they were on at night, you know? Okay. Yeah, I was, like, I was like, wow, this is really smart. The only question that I would have in that system would be, so there is there is a tank that is only going to be lit at like 2 a.m. So when when does work get done on that tank? <laughs> like on the opposite cycle? Is, 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 is just like that. a midnight shift? <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about it. I was, I was purely thinking about just a, a growing coral, but it is a working environment. Yeah. So I think, wow. I wonder how that would work. I mean, I guess it'd probably just work with ambient light on. Maybe. Know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is an interesting environment. Yes. Okay. So you'd say single light, put it at our single level, put it at a yes. working height. Yes. 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 Now, now if, if you're strapped for square footage, like if you only have like a closet to work with, fine. Quadruple deck that that bad boy. But if you if you have room to spread out, be good to your staff. Mm -hmm. Single level. 
So, and uh, then the right level then is go measure uh, the people that are actually doing this uh, and should probably be like, what, like about right here? Um, maximum should be like armpit height because okay. that, that's like the hinge point to, to get in there. Like I said, I want to be able to see through the pain. Correct, because if it's too low, then you have to start bend to like to, to bend down. Yeah. Okay, so I want to be able to see through the pain, but probably at a little bit of an angle. So a little bit below armpit height yep. is the optimal. Just below armpit height. So measure your armpits. There you are. Yep. Uh, tub versus glass. And okay. I've seen this done a hundred different ways. Would you prefer a glass, which is way more expensive. Way and, more. And they're really like time consuming. Cause you have to go hire somebody to wear these fiberglass tubs. You can just go buy in mass, right? Tub or glass? Glass 100 out of 100 times. Yeah. So I started with Rubbermaid stock tanks, which are basically cattle troughs. And the reason why I started with it was because that's all we could afford at the time. And that is one of those containers that is less than a dollar per gallon. And they're incredibly robust. You can stand on the edge of them. They're, they're made to be, you know, gored by cows or bulls, cows, but yep. <laughs> whichever one has the horns. Yep. Um, very, very, very tough. But the, the problem with that is that you can't really observe corals well in a tub like that because the, the top of the water, the, just the, the ripples of the water completely obfuscate whatever's down there. And there's no viewing panels or anything like that. And like the black doesn't reflect anything. I did this too. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought one of those big cattle things and, and uh, it, you couldn't see it. Yeah. I have to turn off all the pumps to be able to see. Correct. And then uh, a lot of times like we would have a colony that looks fantastic top down. As soon as you flip that thing over, the entire bottom side, like basically all I was seeing was like the top layer of cells that are doing well. And the entire like ice, like the iceberg of like dead animal below it mm -hmm. is just all like skeleton and like there might be some like really, really, really weird like uh, crustacean that eats polyps or that, that eats like SPS. They look like white bugs, mm -hmm. like potato bug looking guys. And they've just like devoured the entire bottom. Something like that would happen. And you can't observe that easily because everything top down looks fine. Mm. But right below the surface of that is like all your, all your problematic stuff. So fast forward to today. All of our new tanks all have to be like viewable because yeah, the the value of observation, especially at scale, becomes so valuable that the cost difference to maintain glass and to purchase uh, those aquariums is like it's a it's a non-issue. It's it's so worth it. Yeah, it's, it's the time. If you're building out a brand new facility, you got to order all those things. It can mm. take forever, or I could just you know order those fiberglass tanks. In many cases, they'll just be here. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it comes together, the stories come together for me. It's because I remember now again, you know, my eight inch deep tanks. Uh, yes, they were clear through the side, but because they weren't armpit level and because they were only eight inches deep, I couldn't see through the side without doing this, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but if I had moved them up a little bit and made them deeper, like the, the tank would have been more successful, guaranteed. Because yeah. I can watch it. Yes, because yeah. actually looking at your tanks, is so very, very valuable. I think that we, we discount um, the just uh, w one time I just had like a friend over to, to visit for the weekend, like another uh, like influencer, like a reef aquarium influencer. And for the first time in months, I would say, we just like sat there in front of a tank and just like looked at it, just mm -hmm. looked. And I, I just noticed like 15 different things that I, I, I'm at the I'm at the facility every day. And this is the first time that I really just got to just to t take it all in and, and find like all these things that could have been improved just by, uh, by observing. So mm -hmm. yes, absolutely be able to do that glass aquariums. Okay, now I can't wait to hear this too. Like this is a commercial environment, right? The answer to the question, but. It could be a side hustle at home, who knows? Sure. Uh, size of each tank in the system. There is an optimal size and from somebody who does it for a living, I want to know. Um, I don't know if I've found it yet. I think I've been dabbling. I've been uh, anything. So uh, the, the most recent grow out tanks that we've been working with are between 300 to 500 gallons each. Okay. And Dimensions, then, though. Uh, 10 feet by 
three or four feet by uh, between 15 to 20 inches tall. Okay, so 10 by three to four by the... Right, so, 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 the, so the variance is a couple hundred gallons. Yep. Okay. Between like the biggest and smallest iteration of that. So, so I was gonna go when you, before you said, I was thinking eight feet by about three feet, two feet being two or four feet being a little bit too wide if you wanna get into the center. And I can't mm -hmm. see through the sides all uh, well enough into that area. Hard to reach into the top and eight feet because so many pieces of glass and stuff like come in that length readily available. So that was just like the speed demon and like going mm -hmm. through my head. So why 10? Um, I think at one time, 10 and a half was the largest piece before you get into like custom rolled glass. Okay, so they, they, you can find 10 and a half foot glass. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we went with that. And also it depends on, on, on what floor plan you have available to you. Sometimes like that extra two feet makes it so you lose like walkway space. And that's, okay. that's not a great idea. Like walkway space is far more valuable than your aquariums. Just the trust. Mm -hmm. It's so nice to have like a you know, walking room in and around your tanks. That's the nature of it though. When you build these things out, you think that your goal here is to get as many corals into the space as possible. And of course that's like a parameter you want to do, mm -hmm. but like if the space isn't functional, dude, it, you're not yeah. going to be successful during this. Right. So a, a lot, a lot of our design is very human centric. So we, we planned out like walkways, we planned out access to sinks. Uh, all of that stuff, and then whatever's left, then you can start to plant aquariums. Okay, I, I'll just say this. Uh, I've seen this a hundred times now with uh, all the people I've met that have done this successfully, and everyone starts with narrow little itty bitty walkways where like basically nobody, could, two people couldn't work in the same space at the same time, and you're trying to get as much in there, and that might be the nature of you know a startup, you know, doing this and you know, trying to do it in the smallest space possible, but Every single one of them without fail, when they go on to build the next one, would never do that again. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a functional space. Yes. Yes. I, we even did it here. You know, the, the, the aisles and stuff were like so narrow to pack in as much gear into the smallest space possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we were you know, considering mezzanine. And if you need a ladder, which turned out to be stupid, you know, if you need a ladder to get up there, this is the slowest possible way to do this. You know, <laughs> the rent is of a bigger space is way better. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, that's very, very interesting. So any other things about size of the system? Oh, you okay. said gallons. Is there an optimal amount so, of water? Right. So the, the, the sort of like uh, factors to take into account. Um, you really want to be able to remove every single coral out of that, 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 that volume and treat it separately and put it back. Mm -hmm. So something that might, that's three to 500 gallons might not be manageable for you. Okay. Like that might be like a big production. So for a lot of people, maybe 100 gallons is more mm -hmm. along the lines of what might actually be, because these, these aren't show tanks. Like they, they are working environments. And there's, there's some like drastic measures that sometimes need to be taken. Uh, you need to be able to, again, like fully break those things down, fill them right back up. Um, also, the types of, of fish that you, that you keep. Um, I, uh, it, there, there's an argument to be made that sometimes like a, a whole bunch of small 30 gallon tanks are really, really, really nice. But you're really limiting yourself on some of like the best herbivores, things like that. Uh, because we have, we have like these smaller quarantine tanks that are about 50 gallons and they, they grow some of the best corals. They, they grow them better in those small aquariums than we do in our big three to 500 gallon tanks sometimes. So there was a local store here where uh, I went there and in, you know, most stores you see this really elaborate install and like all the tanks are plumbed together and mm -hmm. this like really elaborate, you know, system. But in this one, they took a different approach and it was like, all like 29 gallon, you know, tanks on the walls. And it was just like a, you know, rolling biofilter on there, you know? Mm -hmm. And my first instinct was like, hmm, this wasn't done very well, you know? Uh, but then later on, it was explained to me two things. One, in these systems, disease doesn't spread, mm -hmm. right? And two, uh, we, when disease does break out, these things can be taken down and started back up instantly. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, there's wisdom in that. Was it, was it a fish system? 
Yeah, or was fish, it a, okay. fish, uh, fish, fish store. Uh, yeah. and it was all fish systems over that way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the corals were largely in like larger systems. But Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. But like, if you think about that for the average person, like sometimes multiple small tanks might be, you know, better options in some cases. Right. Because because once those guys get going, and, and if there's a problem, it's like big deal. There's a reason why you call it a forty breeder, maybe. Yeah. It, you know, it's about eighteen inches deep. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's it's kind of nice, like three feet long, and yeah, huh, interesting. Uh, okay, so you also had in here peninsula style. It has some drawbacks. Okay. So peninsula to me means that you have essentially three viewing angles. Right? With the two long sides mm -hmm. viewable. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yep. Drawbacks. So the, the, the cool thing, the, the, so the, the real cool thing of what we've done is that we've put them back to back. So we have two peninsulas back to back. So you can mm -hmm. basically go all the way around it. And it's like, you know, it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. cool to see. And like the two overflow boxes are, you know, they're, they're facing one another. The problem uh, with peninsulas is mainly flow related, especially mm -hmm. if you wanted to still make it look clean. Because a lot of times what people end up having to do is like stick a, a, a giant power head onto one end of it, especially if we're talking about the, the tank sizes that we're talking about, like 300, 500 gallons, where it's a 10 foot long tank. To get water from that far side back 10 feet the other direction is a major challenge to do pretty. Mm -hmm. Like you can just always brute force it, you know, put like four gyres on that on that face. Why is it a peninsula at all at that point, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you're blocking the the one viewable face in the front cool of everyone, one. the cool one. Yeah. So the, the, just the the uh, the con the flow control on these long like raceway ish tanks becomes a problem uh, in a peninsula style because what ends up happening is if you do it poorly, you just soap scum on that one side of the tank and it just stays there. So I've seen lots of cool SPS Peninsula dis display tanks, right? Mm -hmm. And it can be done. There's no question, right? But, you know, now as somebody who's owned one, it's a constant, like, battle for me that I know I'm sacrificing flow in so many cases, and every solution is ugly, you yeah. know? There's, there's no perfect solution. No. And so, like... I'm not going to go out and say I would never do a Peninsula SPS tank again, but like I would be much less likely to. But would I do a softy or a fish only or a LPS tank or a flowy tank uh, that way? Yeah, because the flow just like isn't as critical to get perfect and I can find ways to do it. But like in an SPS tank where like you we've talked earlier is, you know, in a different episode was was like all of these flow in an SPS tank is a constant evolution. Mm -hmm. Right. And so just when I feel like I finally got it going right in this SPS tank, nah, I'm not going to like start over again and like find all these new dead spots. It is really undesirable to me. Mm -hmm. Like it's frustrating is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's something to be said about just like not going with uh, with such a. A, a pretty style of tank, but make it more usable, make it more functional and easier to, to deal with. Well, and here's the reality is, is like, if you made this mistake and you just put made the peninsula, well, you don't have to go get a tank. You can just put all the pumps on the other side and make that one pretty end ugly. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just a hard thing to stomach. <laughs> yeah. And the cord management. Uh, yeah, the oh, cord. And the super long cords going yeah. down because you can't go down the other side. Yeah. Yeah, and like, in fact, you have to get like custom cords made some case, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, that is actually, that cord thing is one thing I didn't even think about. But like, you definitely, like, if you don't think about this, is that if you do end up putting cords in the other end, like in my case, I got to go six feet that way before I can even go down, mm -hmm. you know? And now what I also probably have is an extension cord, because a lot of these, ta these cords are six feet, that it's exposed to salt spray and stuff, you know. Uh, it's not perfect. It is undesirable, right? Yeah, for sure. All right, you know what? I'm not, I bet you that's a surprise, but there's more of Fan coming up. Uh, you can find all of the special guests in the playlist right here. <laughs>